Hello, my name is Keith Kaufman, and this is my high school senior design project presented in video format. So, before I get into the design itself, I need to introduce a little of the theory behind it first. The staple of the project is the superconductor. A superconductor is a material which, when cooled below its critical temperature, Tc, will have no electrical resistance. And this has some interesting electromagnetic properties. And the first thing you'll observe is the Meissner effect. As the superconductor is cooled past its Tc, it expels all magnetic fields from its interior via electrical currents on the surface. As you can see illustrated in this diagram, no field lines pass through the interior of the material, but instead bend around it. Now because it has no electrical resistance, any motion through the magnetic field it's in will induce currents in the material, and these currents set up the magnetic field that opposes the motion, creating a storing force. If you set up the field correctly when you transition it, then you can achieve levitation. In fact, it will have a sort of memory of the position in the field at which it was originally transitioned due to the Meissner effect, and it can even be removed from the field and placed back in it again and will still return to its original position. This illustration is a very nice one for this because it happens to be the actual orientation of magnets that I use in my design. The magnets are oriented north, south, north in order to produce a field which is oriented such that it provides both vertical and horizontal stability. If you put these magnets into a long track, the superconductor can move freely along them because the field remains the same along its entirety. This technology has already been developed to be used in transport vehicles. There are superconducting maglev trains already in operation today. However, what I aim to do here is to use the same principles to propel the vehicle as well. This would eliminate the need for additional propulsion systems to be added to the track, like linear induction motors, and would instead utilize the superconductors which are already present. Because there is a restoring force whenever the superconductor is in a different region of the field, you can alter the field to exert a force on the superconductor. In this illustration I made, a superconductor is suspended above a track which is divided into sections. The small line represents the magnetic field in that it remains the same along the track. Each of the dark green rectangles represents an electromagnet which can be activated at will. When you activate one of these electromagnets, it will alter the field and the vehicle will feel a repulsive force which seeks to return it back to its regular field. And this is basically how it works. This repulsion can be used both for acceleration and deceleration depending on the direction of travel. In an email correspondence with Andy Wissing, chief engineer of American Maglev Technology, I described this idea for propulsion. One of the problems he pointed out was the need to know the exact position of the vehicle in order to use this method. And that is the problem I aim to solve in this project. My purpose was to create a control system which can propel a levitating superconducting vehicle. Now for the actual design. To make the electromagnets, I used E-shaped ferrite cores, which could be wrapped to produce the north-south-north pattern when the current is passed through them. I did attempt calculations, although I have not taken an EMAG course yet, for the forces you could expect to get out of these given the dimensions of the core, the current, the number of wraps, and the distance above the core. I tried to check this solution with the chief scientist at AMT, and he responded with a derivation which was similar to my answer, except for the area term and a factor of 4 due to the different shapes of the core. So, that being done, there's still the job of determining the location of the vehicle and turning it into useful information to control the track. After looking at the various methods and the challenges associated with each, I decided to use a sensor emitter system, in which each section of track has one sensor associated with it, and the vehicle has emitters mounted on it. The wavelength of the sensors and emitters don't really matter much, as long as one can see the other. But I went with 950 nanometers, which is in the high infrared range. As you can see in this chart, there is a large dip in solar radiation at sea level in that wavelength of light due to the water in the atmosphere, and this would reduce the interference of the sun in activating sensors when they aren't supposed to be. The emitters are simply LEDs which I mounted in a small bank to get the correct coverage, and the sensors are small, cute little through-hole packages. 
The small bump is the part that sees. So now we need a track. The cores needed to be supported so that they could be wrapped and to sit to make a level track. So I used a 3D printer to make a guideway which would hold these cores and could be mounted on a large plank. In this picture you can start to see it take shape. The sensors are positioned looking up to see the vehicle as it moves along. The actual sensor emitter pair communicates in infrared, so I use green LEDs to let you see where the sensors are activated. The circuit itself is not nearly complete in this picture, but the idea is emerging. I might also point out that the sensors are active low, so all of the LEDs are high when nothing is happening. Of course, the sensors only put out a 5 volt TTL signal, and they are not remotely able to drive the propulsion coils so intermediate transistors are necessary to ramp up the current. This is what the final circuit looks like. Each of the sources illustrated corresponds to a rail which goes along the track, and all of these circuits are wired in parallel. On the far right is the inductive load with its accompanying flyback diode, and the resistor, a 1 ohm power resistor for the coils, is located between the power supply and the rail, so they cannot be shown here accurately. The vehicle itself changed over the course of the project to fit the needs. I used a high temperature superconductor, YBCO. It superconducts at 90 Kelvin, which is above the boiling point of liquid nitrogen at 77 Kelvin. This means that liquid nitrogen can be used to cool it, which is much easier to get and deal with than liquid helium. In this project, the vehicle has simply to contain LN2 to remain below TC. In a full-scale design, the vehicle would also need to safely carry its cargo and have an onboard cooling system for maintaining cryogenic temperatures. The original prototype looked something like this, but it was way too big. The final design looked a lot more ugly, but was better. The counterweights were necessary to keep the vehicle balanced, since no superconductors were used to keep it level. The casing is simply house insulation foam carved out by hand rather than a mill like the original one and has channels cut for filling purposes. In order to simulate the vehicle being controlled remotely or on board, very fine wire was suspended above it in order to avoid interfering with its motion. With it, all that is necessary to control the vehicle is a switch for the emitters. Referring back to the concept diagram, you will note that the emitters are offset so that the coil will be on until it is directly beneath the superconductors at which point it will turn off and the next one will turn on. This will maintain a constant force on the vehicle in the desired direction, and this is how the control system operates. The switch controls simply which emitter, front or back, is on. Now for testing. The first thing I tested was the response speed of the circuit. This is critical for the system because the delay in the response puts a practical limit on how fast it can go before it can't stop again, although you could still compensate for it even then. I used a two-channel oscilloscope to measure the delay. The first trace was attached to a clock source, which was also powering an emitter. The emitter was pointed directly at the sensor so that it flashed on and off at regular intervals. The second trace was attached to the load upstream of the transistor, so when current is flowing, the voltage goes to zero. By looking at the space between the rising edge of the clock source, in other words, the LED turning on, and the falling edge of the load, in other words, the coil is running, I can measure the delay in the response, and the result is two microseconds. That's pretty fast, and if you do the math for it, the vehicle would have to be going really fast for this to be a problem. The second thing I tested was the levitation, propulsion, and control. The track design underwent several iterations based on the observed results before the end, and I will briefly describe each stage. Using my illustrations again, the first design was simply the cores with permanent magnets mounted on top of them, each pole corresponding with a prong of the core to produce the field illustrated before. As expected, it was able to levitate, but was not stable. It would tip and fall into the gaps, and of course could not move freely along it. The second design attempted to address this by placing iron bars over the cores and having permanent magnets along it. This resulted in stable levitation, and the vehicle was almost free to move along it. There were small humps and valleys it settled into, which were caused by slight changes in the field due to the cores underneath. These were small enough that I went ahead and tried propulsion anyway. 
However, the bars diffuse the magnetic field generated by the cores along the track, so much so that they could not be used to push the vehicle at all. The final design had the permanent magnets above the track, mounted to the wood you saw earlier. This kept the cores from interfering with the smooth field just by being there, and it allowed for the cores to alter specific areas on the field. This video shows it operating without the control system. One core is activated with an emitter manually to push the vehicle. Finally, the whole thing is set up. All I'm doing to control it is flipping a switch. As you can see, there's a small dead spot where neither sensor can see it, and this can't push on it, and it gets stuck there. So there you have it. The control system is very simple. It only has two controls, the direction and the magnitude of the force. It will remain accurate over any length of track. It can be very precise. It can operate at high speeds and it can have redundancy. Every aspect of this project can be scaled up for real world applications, but there are still some challenges to be addressed. The vehicle must be kept stable, in this design, I had to incorporate counterweights to maintain stability, but if another superconductor were added above one of the outer magnetic rails, it would have been very stable as well. Perhaps the most important challenge is that of keeping the field smooth while still allowing for propulsion coils to directly change it. In my design, the solution was to separate the permanent magnets from the cores by placing them above the track. But this is not an ideal solution, and will limit potential uses. I'm confident that some configuration can be made that will be satisfactory. So that concludes my project. Thanks for watching.